All right, if you watched the last video, you saw me tear this transmission apart. And this video is going to sort of tie in with the last one. I've got the engine and torque converter over there ready to come apart now. But before I get into that, let me go over a couple things from the last video real quick. Here's the control valves and stuff off that transmission from the last video. And in that video, I was showing you this little hydraulic manifold, and I was talking about these two solenoids. I was trying to figure out why they had this solenoid over here in the LU port instead of in the DN port where it belongs. And I didn't explain this very well. And so I wound up with a bunch of comments, people saying that's the LU port. It's for torque converter to lock up. The solenoid's there to port oil to the clutch and the torque converter to lock it up. Normally they'd be correct, but in this case, they're not. In the D400E Series 2, the LU port is not used. It should just be plugged solenoid should be in the dn port so what i was thinking and what i was asking is i thought maybe there was some sort of a diagnostic test or something like that maybe where you would switch the solenoids and then check a pressure somewhere or something like that but that's not the case long story short the solenoid should not be in the lu port there's no reason that it's there other than somebody just put it there by mistake and that's pretty much all there is to that Okay, moving on to the topic of this video. This is the engine and torque converter that came out of the same truck that the transmission from the last video came out of. So this is a 3406E 9AP prefix machinery application engine, 14.6 liter displacement. And I think these are rated 427 horsepower in the D400E Series 2. I'm going to plug into the ECM here in a minute. We'll see if that's right. I think it is. And this engine would be capable of a whole lot more power than that with the injectors that are in it and whatnot. But that's where it's rated at for this application. I just went ahead and pulled the ECM off of it. And I had to throw this little harness together with cat data link in it. Now, a lot of these 40 pin ECMs that I've seen with machinery or industrial application files in them. Uh, pin 9 will be positive cat data link. Pin 3 will be negative cat data link. And there's nothing special about that ECM. It's just a 10R4085. You could find that on any on-highway truck engine, a whole bunch of different applications. But uh, with the machinery file in it, the pinout changes a little. So it looks like I just got connected to it here. I've got an 8PS792 D400E Series 2. Pretty sure that's the right serial for this truck. Not much to these files. So 426 horsepower at 2,000 RPM, 1,488 foot-pounds at 1,200 RPM. That's a pretty low rating for a 3406E. Total time showing 1,076 hours. Now that's because this is a pretty fresh Reman ECM. So that's going to be, I'm guessing, that's just going to be the time that's on this new ECM. That's obviously not the total time on the whole truck. Uh, total fuel in that 1,076 hours is 5,060 gallon, about five gallon an hour. So she was just sipping the fuel. All right, last thing I want to look at here. So we got 1,076 hours on the diagnostic clock, and most of these are happening right now. That's because everything's unhooked. So obviously we're going to have a bunch of code. So none of that really matters to me, but. What caught my interest here is this one I've got highlighted that first happened at 1,021. Transmission control abnormal update rate, and that's 296-9. So I'm going to go look that code up and see exactly what that is and what it means. That very well may have something to do with the reason they quit using this truck. All right, I looked that code up in SIS, and what I'm finding for 296-9, they're calling it unable to communicate with transmission ECM. So this is the transmission ECM right here, and there's multiple different reasons why the engine ECM wouldn't be able to communicate with this ECM. Could be a broken wire, bad connection, who knows. I guess the only one I'm reasonably going to be able to pinpoint would be if this ECM actually died, so not going to mess with it right now, but maybe at the end of the video, I'll come out here and pull this ECM off, try to communicate with it, and try to figure out if it's even still alive.
greasy piece of shit. I didn't pressure wash it because there's too many open holes between those hydraulic pumps over there and this flywheel housing setup with these pump drives and whatnot. I didn't want to get water and all that stuff. I'd rather just tear it apart dirty. This engine's got a rebuild tag on it from Holt Power Systems. I think you can read that. Rebuild date, June 2003, and the work order number is LGO or LG0-1704. So that doesn't say a whole lot for the original build on this engine. This is about a 2000 year model truck. So if they had to rebuild the engine in 03, it only lasted about three years. Now that could have been something that went wrong at the factory or it could have also been operator error. Things are looking a little better here. Got the wiring harness off of it, fuel lines off of it, starters gone. It had a pretty new starter on it. I pulled all the belts off of it, the alternator and alternator bracket. All these are good. Bearings are fine. Got the pulleys off the front of it. Crank dampers off, front engine mounts off. Oh, well, all these oil coolers here are all still together. Let me explain this setup and what's going on here quickly. So this is the engine oil cooler, pretty much the standard oil cooler you're gonna find on most any 3406E out there. And then these two bigger coolers back here are where things get a little more specific to this application. So this upper one, that is the brake oil cooler. The brakes on these trucks have oil that continuously flows through them to cool them, and then that oil is in turn sent through this oil cooler to be cooled down. This lower cooler is the transmission and torque converter oil cooler. All right, see if I can get this brake oil cooler off of here. I think I got all the bolts out of it. Do you see that bolt right there? Yeah, that won't come off there till you take that bolt out. Should work a lot better now. Perfect. These oil coolers have seen better days, which is what I would expect. They're uh, 23, 24 years old by now. So that's not a bad service life for an oil cooler. Rubber starting to blow out of the ends of them pretty bad. This thing's got a remote mounted oil filter set up on it because uh, normally the oil filter on one of these engines would be mounted right here below the oil cooler. It would screw on right there. But the way these sit in the truck, you'd never be able to get to that spot to change the filter. So that's why they remote mounted it over there on the other side. Here's one of these engines mounted in a truck and right down in there, you can see that spot. So you can see why they didn't put the filter there. That'd be a nightmare. There's the oil coolers or the top one. That'd be the brake oil cooler. And there's the transmission oil cooler down in there. 
All right, I'm gonna try to get the torque converter split away from the engine now. So it should pretty much just be a matter of pulling all these bolts out all the way around. And then the torque converter should slide apart from the engine. I'm sure it won't be that easy, but should be about all there is to it. Got the ass end of the engine held up. Got all the bolts out of the torque converter housing all the way around now. So still don't really have any kind of a gap here at all. Very, very little anyway, so that's kind of what I figured. There'll be a pretty snug fit between the torque converter housing and this ring that bolts onto the flywheel housing. At least I think that's gonna be a big ring that's bolted onto it. I've seen some uh, 3500 series, 3508s set up that way. So um, put this little plate back on here. This is not the ideal lifting apparatus, but it's what I'm gonna do. So this whole engine torque converter, the whole rear end of this thing is hanging in the air right now by this uh, quarter inch chain. That should be fine. What I'm gonna do now is let this thing down. This is the flywheel housing right here. It's gonna sit down on these blocks. It's gonna leave the torque converter off the ground. And then I'm gonna come back and grab a hold of the torque converter. And then hopefully using this hoist, I'm gonna work that apart. That hoist will roll towards me and hopefully separate these two units. Well, that hadn't been real easy, but I think I've got it on the move now. Got a pretty good gap opened up here. Been beating on it down here on the bottom of this torque converter housing with that oak block right there and a sledgehammer. And then I've been beating on this side the same way, that little finger that sticks out there. And then I've got this come along deal rigged up here, putting some good firm tension on it. It's not pulling real hard. If it was, it'd just pull everything down off the blocks, but it's just pulling hard enough to keep that nice and tight. What happens when you've got something that seals together like this with a firm slip fit and an O-ring, you can beat on this thing all day long, and it may flex out just a little bit when you hit it with the hammer, but the O-ring will pull it right back in, and you'll never gain on it. But if you can put some good firm tension on it and then hit it, you'll slowly gain on it, and that's what I've been doing. So I think it's just about ready to let go. Let me try to catch this on video. Just about there. I'm gonna give her another click on the come along there. May need to pick up on it just a touch more. That's down. There she is. All right, I've got an engine and a torque converter, and they are not one piece anymore, so that's real good. This is set up just like I thought it was gonna be. There's the big ring that bolts to the flywheel housing. And there's some gears on the back side of this flywheel that are driven, which are in turn driving these two pump drives up here. So that just splines into the flywheel right inside of there. That's how that's driven. I'm gonna pull these two hydraulic pumps off the engine next and get them out of the way. So I'll explain a little bit about these real quick. Um, the truck uses four main hydraulic pumps during the normal operation of the truck. Two of them are right here. This bigger pump is the steering pump. That's a piston pump. The smaller pump that piggybacks off the back of the steering pump is the brake pump. That's also a piston pump. And then there should be a pump mounted right here as well. That is the hoist pump. That's a gear pump. And then the fourth main pump would be mounted right here to the torque converter. And that is the torque converter scavenge pump slash transmission pump.
pulled this little cover plate off this side of this pump drive. It's splined all the way through. So you could drive pumps off either side of this thing or both. Same thing on this side. There's the adapter ring deal that I just pulled out of there. It seals into the flywheel housing with an O-ring just like the torque converter seals into it. There's shit everywhere, so I'm gonna regroup, clean up a little bit, and then I'll carry on. That's better. I'm gonna drop this flywheel off here now. Nothing to that, just pull those 12 bolts out and it'll come off there. And then after that, I'm going to swing the hoist in here, pick this thing up, and drop the oil pan off of it. And then I'll get the engine block sitting on wood blocks. And then I can pull the flywheel housing, front cover, get this stuff off the side, and then it'll be time to pull the head off. Okay, I got her hanging in the air. Got the pan off of it. Didn't find anything in the pan that shouldn't be there at all. Just a wool flywheels off of it it's laying over there here's what the rear gear setup looks like on this thing so you've got this gear here that's press fit on the back of the crankshaft and it's driving these two idlers which drive the two pump drive gears i pulled the two idler gears off of it nothing to that you just take the uh, three bolts out work them back and forth a few times and they'll come right out of there by hand. And then this crank gear is just a real snug slip fit on there. I've just about got it worked loose. I'm gonna pull it off there now. That flywheel housing looks like it's probably 200 plus. I'm not gonna manhandle that. Not when I got a hoist hanging right here. It's raining pretty good out there. I don't know if you can even hear me, but uh, when I get one like that that won't let go, I just come in here and I fold the lip down on the inner part of this seal, and then that'll let the outer part of the seal slide right over it and come apart. Another option would be to just pull the seal completely out before you even start. That's, that's really probably the smartest option, but I don't know, I never do it. If I was very smart, I wouldn't be doing this shit to begin with. It won't leave a mark on the crank anywhere if you do that right. All right, I'm gonna get all the rest of this stuff off this side of the engine. Engine oil cooler, oil filter base, water pump, regulator housing, turbo, and exhaust manifold. Then I can pull the front cover off of it and the head will be ready to come off after that.
Well, I got all that stuff off of there. Manifold came off without too much trouble, so that was good. And you can see the inserts that go into the head here. They just come out of there like that. Here's the rundown on the sensors. That's the intake air temperature sensor. This engine is using the side crankcase breather, not my favorite, but it is. So that's already off the engine, it's right here. So that is the atmospheric pressure sensor right there. Uh, manifold pressure sensor, also called boost. That's a speed and timing sensor. That's a speed and timing sensor. You can see that they're both reading off the cam gear, which is not here anymore, but there's one of them right there. There's the other one up there. And then a uh, coolant temperature sensor right here. And the oil pressure sensor is down here, screwed into the block. There is also one more sensor that is the fuel temperature sensor. It's not here uh, on these trucks. There is a remote mounted fuel filter base and that's where the fuel temperature sensor is at. And if you wanna see what the cam gear looks like, this is it right here. That's another one that's almost identical to it, but not. This is the front side of it. This is the back side of it. This would be the side the sensors read off of. So the sensors are reading off these little pegs that stick up on the back. And then you'll notice somewhere in here right there, there's three of them close together. So that's what's telling it where it's at as far as how fast it's going and where it's at in the rotation of the cam gear. Front cover's coming off. This old front main seal here gave up real quick. These older seals are no problem. A few taps with the hammer, they'll come right apart. There's the inside of it. And there's what it looks like with no front cover. So I'm gonna zip these gears off here now. Nothing to that, just those three bolts in each one. The little plate comes off and the gear slides off the stub shaft. I'll show you the stub shafts when I get the gears off. There's the stub shafts that the gears run on. They're coming off next. Stub shafts are gone. All right, I got the front gear plate pulled off of it. And I pulled the camshaft out of the head. Sitting right over there. There's the camshaft bore. A lot of the parts that are supposed to be in the head are not here anymore. That's because I started cannibalizing this thing for parts a long time ago. So the injectors, rocker arms and rocker shafts and jake brakes were already gone. But anyway, uh, next thing I'm gonna do is pull this valve cover base off here, which is just these bolts that go around the outside of it, all the way around it. And after that, it'll be time to pull the head bolts out and pull the head off. All right, here's the bottom of the cylinder head. Everything I'm seeing here looks really good. I don't see any cracks anywhere. So that head should be a good candidate for rebuilding. Usually they're not, especially when they come off of an on-highway truck engine, but machinery and industrial applications are a different deal they run higher rpms egts are typically cooler because of that and they're just not nearly as bad about cracking heads no surprises here with the cylinders they're showing some wear but nothing nothing too bad they look polished on this camera they're not as bad as they look it's hard to tell but there is some cross hatch left in there 
So I didn't really expect to find anything wrong with this engine. I've seen this engine run before. Uh, actually, I think I have a video clip of it running. If I do, I'll throw it in right now. Uh, really, the only reason I'm even tearing this thing apart is because I need the crankshaft out of it for a customer. If it wasn't for that, I probably wouldn't even be doing this. So let me get the rods and pistons out of it now, get the crank dropped out of the block, and that'll be it for the engine. And then I can get onto this torque converter. And just a quick note, when I was talking about these things cracking heads a lot in an on-highway application, they'll typically crack them in between valves, like right there where that little recessed area is the most common spot. And it's not something that generally causes any real problem. It usually doesn't go to water or anything like that unless the engine gets overheated. It's just one of those things where when you've got a head that's got a crack in it, do you really want to rebuild that head and use it again? I don't. I pulled the spacer plate and the spacer plate gasket off of it. It's laying right there. So here is the bare engine block deck. Rods and pistons all look good. Nothing unexpected, no broken rings or anything like that. Here's the inside of the block with no main caps on. This is the 137-8466 E-block. So this is probably the best block in this engine family. If you're asking me, I've seen the least amount of problems with this block. You won't break this block. I don't care how much power you make with it. If you do, there was something already wrong with it. It's got the extra bracing in between these three main journals right here. And then each main journal also has the extra webbing on each one. All the blocks in this engine family are good. There's really nothing wrong with any of them, but that one right there is my favorite. And here's a look at the crank. It looks really good, which is a good thing because that's the main reason I tore this engine apart. So I'll get that off to the machine shop and get it measured and magged and balanced and polished and all that. And that should be a good one. Okay, last thing to do with this engine is get the block laid back down flat and start pulling the liners out. All right, I got all the liners pulled out of it. Everything looks pretty good. Grab this light and we'll take a look at these lowers. From what I've seen so far, they all look pretty good with the exception of number five. You don't really know for sure till you get them all cleaned up real good, but I think most of them are gonna be just fine without any machine work. That's number five right there. It's hard to tell on camera, but there's a little damage to that one. 
But all in all, pretty good. I think I'll get away with probably only having to fix one or two out of the six, which is a good thing. A block that doesn't need a bunch of work in the lowers is worth a lot more than one that does. It takes about you know, roughly $2,000 to fix all six of them at the machine shop. Now I can move on to the torque converter. All right, I'm off to a great start here. But I uh, pulled the suction screen out of the bottom of this thing. And there seems to be some sort of a metallic goop down at the bottom of it. So I'm not real sure what that means just yet. Other than that, it's pretty clean. And uh, I want to make it really clear before I get into this that I have absolutely no idea what I'm doing here. I have never in my entire life ever been into one of these torque converters. I think it'll be pretty straightforward, but uh, I guess we're fixing to find out. I laid it over on its face and dumped a bunch more oil all over the floor. But this is the way the service manual wants it for disassembly. And right there is the hole that the suction screen came out of. That's a shim that just fell out of there. All right, I got all the bolts out around this thing. And there's two forcing holes in this case, one of them right there, one of them over here. They're one half 13, which is the same as the bolts that came out of here. So I've got them threaded into the forcing holes now. It was a little bit of, well, I cleaned them out first and then I've got a little oil on the threads. And according to the manual, I'm gonna use those two forcing holes and bolts to push this case up off the torque converter itself. Okay, there's the torque converter. The manual says that weighs 397 pounds and it says the case weighs 338. Next thing it wants me to do is flip this over and get it sitting opposite of the way it is now. This is the pump drive right here. So that right there is driving this splined collar right here, which the transmission and torque converter scavenging pump splines into. And then that gear is being driven by this gear right here. That don't look quite right. I put that back up on there where it would have came from. I guess that's a torch seal. It's definitely been way too hot. It's still kind of rubbery, but not really. Okay, next thing to do is take those two bolts out and this little plate off. Not looking too good in there. Flip back over again now. Next thing to do, it says, is take these bolts out around here, pull this cover off, and uh, get 
get these o-rings off of here it says to remove this shaft assembly next it looks like it just pulls straight up out of there so I'm gonna take this bolt I'm gonna use that for a handle and see if I can get this to come out of here Pulled this snap ring out of there. It was right down in there. That's what holds this carrier assembly to the rest of this unit. So I'm gonna pull that off there now. Here's that carrier assembly that I just picked up off there. There's a bearing down in there. It looks fine. I don't see anything wrong with that unit at all. Next thing it says to do is pull this snap ring off of here and then take all these bolts out all the way around and then I can pick that up off there. rusty in here but the corrosion probably happened after they parked the truck after they took it out of service so I don't think that was the cause I think that's just an effect looks like maybe a little more of that metallic goop stuff down in there but I'm not seeing anything that's destroyed or any obvious signs of failure here yet All right, I pulled this thing the rest of the way apart off camera. It just sort of happened that way. Sometimes I can't really help myself, but you didn't miss anything and stuff just lifts straight up out of there. And I think I've got the failure figured out. But let me show you this first. Nothing seems too far out of place with any of this. A little bit of rust residue on it, whatnot from sitting around, but nothing destroyed, nothing that looks like it failed. And I don't understand what all this is about in here. It's got these rollers that were falling out of it. I'll have to do some research on that, see what that is and what its purpose is, because I have no idea. And the oil that was coming out of here had some metallic particle in it that looked real similar, pretty much identical to what I found in the transmission valve body in the last video. But uh, here is what I think happened. This metallic goop that I'm seeing in here, I think is friction disc material. And I think the lockup clutch here and the torque converter has failed. So I'm fixing to pull this lockup clutch apart and find out for sure what happened, but it all makes sense. As this clutch started to fail, it would have gotten really hot because the disc would have been slipping. The heat's what took this bearing out and then that also explains why they may have been messing with those solenoids in the manifold on the transmission. Once the clutch burned out in this torque converter, obviously it would have quit locking up. And that may be why they moved that solenoid to the LU port. They were just trying anything they could think of to get the torque converter to lock up again. All right, here's the first steel disc or steel plate. Definitely looks like it's done some slipping, but it doesn't look torched. Here's the first clutch disc. I can already see there's plenty of friction material on this side. 
It doesn't look too bad. That side's about the same. Okay. next plate it's definitely done some slipping but it's not completely smoked Yeah, I mean, these look worn to me, but they're they're definitely not burnt up. I really expected to see them where they were just completely flat, smooth, just smoked, but they're not. All right, let me try to get that piston out of there now. that up out of there so this is the clutch piston I'm just gonna look at this ring really well make sure it's not cut or torn something that would explain a loss of pressure to apply the clutch it looks fine This looks heat discolored to me. I don't know if you can really tell on camera there, but looks to me like that's been really hot. And the only thing I can come up with that would get that right there really hot is this clutch slipping. So even though it's not completely smoked, I still think that clutch was slipping and that's where the heat came from that destroyed that bearing. That was a sealed bearing and this stuff right here, that's what's left of the seal. So if you look at this oil, I mean, you can tell there's lots of friction material in it. So I think that's what was going on. I think the lockup clutch was definitely slipping. They just stopped before they completely burn it up. I mean, it takes a lot of slipping to completely burn all that friction material off those discs. There's a better shot of the heat discoloration I'm talking about right there. The light's hitting that different now. Yeah, see that? It's not like that on this side. I don't know, that's the best explanation I got. Back to this thing real quick before I forget. I figured out what this is. This is a one-way clutch. So what it does is it uh, allows the stator to, let me make sure I explain this right, it allows the stator to freewheel when the converter is in direct drive, meaning when the lockup clutch is engaged, and it holds it stationary when the converter is in converter drive. So I should be able to demonstrate that if I can get this shaft to go back down in here, which I probably can't. Let me try to get that in there. Okay, I got it in there. So see, it'll allow this to freewheel in this direction, but then it won't that direction. So it's just a one-way clutch. All right, that's pretty much it for the torque converter. I mean, I could tear some of these sub-assemblies down a little bit further. I could press bearings off shafts and stuff like that, but that doesn't really serve me any purpose right now. What I do want to do though, before I finish this video, is run out there and grab the powertrain ECM off the side of that cab. I showed you that towards the beginning of the video. I want to get that ECM in here and plug into it and try to figure out whether it's alive or dead. This looks like it may be the original powertrain ECM to this truck. It's hard to say, but it's a pretty long life if it is. All right, I just got connected to it. I had to re-rig my harness a little bit, but this ECM is alive. 
I'm not going to worry about digging into it too far as far as a bunch of codes and stuff because we're going to have plenty anyway the way I'm connected to this. But at least I can rule out total ECM failure as being part of the problem or the whole problem. Doesn't necessarily mean that there wasn't still broken wires or bad connections or whatnot, but at least I know the ECM wasn't dead. So after all this, I don't have anything that I can point to and say, right here was the whole problem, this is destroyed, and this is why they parked the truck. But with the combination of the solenoids and that manifold on the transmission being messed with, the lockup clutch that was pretty obviously slipping, it looks to me like it got really hot and smoked that bearing, something smoked that bearing. And I don't believe that it was just a simple bearing failure because that would not have led them to park the truck. That bearing hadn't failed completely yet. It was just on its way to failure. They would have had no way of knowing that that bearing was like that if that were the only problem in this whole system. So best guess I can come up with, lockup clutch was slipping. They figured out that it was slipping. They decided it was an old enough truck. They weren't going to fix it because that's a pretty major fix. I mean, to fix the clutch itself is not that big a deal, but by the time you get this torque converter out of the truck and get it put back in, that's a major job. So that's the best thing I can come up with. And they just deemed that the old truck wasn't worth fixing. Probably a bigger company. And they probably went and bought a new eight or $900,000, 40 or 45 tonner and uh, carried on. So I've got a huge mess to clean up. I'm gonna get started on that. I guess that's all I got for this one. Thanks for watching.